Revolution Radio proudly presents live from Phoenix, Arizona, the Truth Deny Talk Radio with host Roxy Lopez. Join us here for topics you won't hear about on mainstream news, such as chemtrails, GMOs, nutrition, and conspiracy facts regarding your personal sovereignty. Humanity is 7 billion strong. We are the majority. And now, live from the Valley of the Sun, your host, Roxy Lopez. And a good evening to everybody, and thanks for joining us tonight. Hello, chat room. I see all of you. you got any questions for either one of our guests tonight, go ahead and post them. Our producer will get them to me. And then, of course, everyone that's on the event pages, man, you guys are just pouring in there. Um, really appreciate the listenership. You are just uh you're wonderful. You're absolutely wonderful. Um, we will be answering questions that you have listed also in the on the event page, and so uh, we'll try to get to everything. Hey, you know, I don't know uh, we've, we're, we're, what's going on. I don't know what you're hearing on your end, everybody out there, but it, it's all good. I believe that we just had a probably a commercial free, almost a, an entire commercial free um, uh, hour with James Gilliland, and of course, I'm excited to. Uh, uh, bring our next guest on. Um, he has also been to the show uh, before, and it's just fabulous. Um, his name is uh, Wilbur Allen, and uh, Wilbur is a former uh, White House Air Force One engineer for ABC News. Wilbur Allen has been a contactee since childhood uh, when he was implanted, and since then he has forensically documented sightings and anomalies. He discussed his recent trips to investigate Area 51 and Sedona, his tele. Uh, telepathic encounters with UFOs and analysis of various sightings. And in the Sedona Desert, while documenting the sky late at night, he said he saw an object come out of a warp and the dogs and coyotes immediately started to howl. Uh, then something drew blood from his finger, he says, and um, left a very unusual puncture wound. And when Will told me about that, I, I thought, oh my goodness. But, um, you know, in video footage uh, he shot in Rachel, Nevada, he made a, the statement, show it to me. And in 15 seconds later, an aerial object appeared, which he believes demonstrates telepathy between humans and ETs. Additionally, while shooting at the perimeter of Area 51, he heard a disembodied voice commanding him to pack his stuff and get out. I, I wouldn't even know what I'd do if I heard that. And at Area 51, the military is working with the assimilated alien technology and have operational craft possibly built with the assistance of ETs. Alan has surmised this, you know, uh, so we'll see. We'll we'll get it behind this. Um, recent years, you know, uh, camera sensitivity has increased tenfold, allowing some of the cloaked ships to be caught on camera, particularly in high-speed shutter images shot at one eight thousandth of a second. So I really look forward to seeing what's happening next. And without any further ado, welcome, Wilbur Allen. How are you? I'm well. Thank you for having me again, Rossi. Oh, that's good. To, I'm glad that you're well. And this last trip, well, you know, you're you're record, you're doing a documentary right now, so I'm sure it's just full of a bunch of really cool stuff. Um, but this really intrigued me. Um, you know, I believe that you were in Sedona when this um, object came out of warp. I was in Sedona in the desert, and I, I really couldn't tell you where in the desert I was because what I what I had done. I think we talked about this before, but. I had uh, gone uh, from my hotel location um, outside of the hotel perimeter in absolute darkness with a camera and a tripod, and I started walking, and I walked for about 45 minutes. And in the middle of the desert, um, where I could not tell you where I was because I couldn't see a thing, I started to uh, set my camera up and uh, photograph the skies, and as I started photographing the skies, all of the dogs and coyotes started howling. And when I looked at the film at that point, I noticed that there was an object that materialized out of nowhere, and it was completely enshrouded in cloud-like matter. And in every shot where this anomaly was imaged, that this cloud matter was dissipating from it. And at some point in the sample, it seemed to have been discharging smaller anomalies into the air as it, it came to a uh, stop. It stopped in the sky. It was absolutely abstract. Oh, my goodness. 
And and what were these you, you, things that was dropping out? Was it other craft? I'm I'm going to make it make uh, a wild call and say yes, it was other craft because based on the samples, there were anomalies that would appear on this cylindrical like anomaly that was photographed, and that in each shot afterwards, that these white anomalies that appeared on the cylindrical sur- on the surface cylinder were um, discharged into the air. And you could see these objects streaming off of them, off of the object that uh, slowed down and stopped. So based on that footage we got in the desert at that point, we're going to make a calculated guess and assume that is where the object's base is, and we're going to try to find that base when we go back into the desert in the next few weeks. Oh, really? Yeah. Um, so, so you really don't know exactly where you were, but you're going to try to hunt that down. And then, what about this, um, the puncture on your finger? Now, how did how did that happen? I I I, I can't tell you because I'm I'm not really sure exactly what what transpired when I was out there. Um, all I could say is that when I went from the desert back to my hotel, that on my finger was um, this very unusual puncture wound. And I say unusual in a sense because on the surface of the finger was a small orifice where obviously something had gained entrance into the finger. But underneath the skin was an area which looked as if it had been bored out and pieces of the tissue that were in my fingers were unplugged and pulled out uh, as this thing, whatever it was, drew blood from my finger. It was very abstract. And you had mentioned to me that it took about six weeks to heal. Uh, it took an extremely long time to heal. I'd never seen anything quite like that before because, you know, what, what was the interesting thing is was the small orifice at the surface but the larger wound underneath the skin. What gained entrance to my finger? What could possibly take a piece of finger or a sample out of my finger like that without... Uh, doing damage, removing the tissue from the finger itself. And it was very unusual in the sense that what I'm saying is with this small hole, how could there be a larger hole underneath it? It's impossible. That's right. That's right. That's interesting. Did, now, did that kind of freak you out? Um, it did in the sense, but, you know, after all of the years of unusual things that happened in the past, it wasn't out of the common, out of the ordinary. But... It was indeed something that I felt um, I felt violated by that. Oh sure, sure. Um, that that would be. Uh, now, what else is what? What brought you to check out Sedona, Arizona? Anyway, is, is there what guided you to that area? Well, I was um, I'm a cast member to uh, a reality show called My Big Red Net Vacation. Oh. And on this show, I'm the um, UFO expert, along with uh, Riley Martin, who's with the Howard Stern Show. And uh, we were we were basically contacted by Country Music Channel to um, be on the show to um, kind of guide these rednecks in Area 51 in Sedona um, through areas where there would be UFOs and aliens, and that's exactly what we did. And during the filming of the show, they were more concerned about filming us than they were concerned about filming the sky. And in the sky during the filming, we were actually having a close encounter. Isn't that something? So you weren't really there to document UFOs then? Um, I I was there not necessarily to document UFOs, but of course, since I am a UFO researcher, that is indeed what I did do. And that what footage that I obtained and what footage that was obtained by the Country Music Channel, which is a part of MTV, is completely different. They were more into the entertainment side of it while I was into the actual doing of UFO research while we were filming. And I did do UFO research while I was filming. And during filming of the entire production in all three locations that I was paid to go to, I had encounters with anomalies that were outside or what we would consider conventional aircraft. Okay. Um, now, you had also mentioned that whatever was in Sedona, I believe, followed you back to D.C. 
Um, no, it's what was in Area 51 that followed me back. To ah, me. gotcha. Okay, I got that wrong. So what was in Area – let's back up a little. What was in Area 51 that followed you back to D.C.? I I um, was in the desert, and the gate perimeter of Area 51, the base itself, without necessarily going over the area itself where it has sensors, if you cross the sensors, the – Base security personnel come to get you. So while shooting at the perimeter, um, uh, and I was more interested in the airspace than I was in the base itself. And, and while we were there, they were filming various areas of Area 51, or trying to film various areas of Area 51. And while I was in the desert um, shooting, something communicated with me telepathically and commanded me to leave. And as it commanded me to leave, within a minute of getting back to the van, which it, it took basically about two minutes for me to pack my stick back or getting that command to leave, and I complied immediately when I got that order. When I got back to the van, within one minute of arriving to the van, this unmarked government vehicle shot out the main gate going about 60 or 70 miles an hour from Area 51, and it was in the exact same trajectory and path that I was standing at taking the pictures of the anomalies in the sky. So basically, they warned me to get out of there before I got hit by this car. Oh, I see. So you already knew something was happening when you saw them racing out of the base. I knew something was up, you know, and when you think about it, one of the things that um, I've found more interesting than the base itself was the airspace above the base, and that's why I focused my cameras, and my cameras did indeed capture airborne anomalies that were inconsistent with any aircraft that was possibly known to man. Inconsistent with that. Now, are you working with anybody right now? I I know that you've done, um, I guess, uh, some some work with uh, Dr. Edgar Mitchell. Is that correct? Uh, We're, we're in fact... um, this new production that's in the mix right now is a part of the production that's being done by the BBC and Discovery Channel. Mm-hmm. And that is indeed part of this uh, production that I'm um, a part of uh, that's going to be in production in the next week or so. Does he does he work with you out in the field, or, or is that something different oh, that he contributes? Or possibly going to go to Florida and meet up with him there. Oh, I see. So... Um, with all that in mind, um, when does when does this come out on Discovery? Um, I'm going to take a wild shot and say in 2004 because the fact that we're in production of it right now, and generally speaking, it would take a few months before it actually does get into the programming element of the Discovery Network. But we are indeed um, going to have a show based on the uh, level of research that I'm going to be conducting in the desert of Sedona on UFOs. And that's going to be the primary basis of this program that BBC is in production with. Now, you know, being that you have been out to Area 51 uh, more than once, and you, you, when you were on the show the last time, you, you really had, you know, a few pictures that you were willing to share with us, and you did, um, of what you were uh, shooting in those skies over Area 51. Um, as the government, you know, the government... Uh, the government's involvement, I should say, have they have they tried to harass you at all or anything, Wilbur, because of how close you've gotten to not just Area 51, but um, some of your footage is pretty astounding. Uh, in fact, it's quite the opposite. I, I started um, after lecturing with Edgar Mitchell, started noticing that I was picking up um, a large percentage of the senior NASA launch administrators on my LinkedIn page, and I thought that was rather interesting because essentially they were, um, by the fact that they were confirming friendship on LinkedIn, they were essentially acknowledging the research that I had been publishing on my website. And it's interesting in the sense that what I'm showing is something that could possibly or should possibly be conducted by um, federal agencies that, uh, that should be involved with uh, aerial activity in airspace that would be known as the United States, but it doesn't seem to be an issue here. We want to skirt the fact that these UFOs are showing up, and, and the realities are that based on the physical evidence that is on the market, that there's without a doubt an extraterrestrial presence in our airspace. Mm-hmm. 
Do you think that uh, a lot of people in government don't know that? I think you know that, but I think mm -hmm. that, um, you know, that don't ask, don't tell kind of feel they have with feeling the sexuality of other people. Sure. That, that's the mentality they have with extraterrestrials also. So they just uh, don't don't talk about it. And, um, and uh, well, and I just want to know, like, it, well, I would think that some people in government don't even have access to these types of files or these they, types they, of photos. They they're, they're held in, in obscurity just as we are, and it's almost at a level where it's a need-to-know basis, and especially with the type of materials that I'm able to generate with the cameras that I do have. And if it was not for the fact that the physical documentation that was substantially taken by NASA during the Apollo moon program, that I was able to match NASA moon footage to anomaly sun imaging here. And that's what the basis of this analysis is. It's already been established that these objects are real. Now we have physical samples, not only in space, but the same objects on Earth. So what does that say? Right. I don't, I don't know what that says. What does it say? <laughs> well, it says, it says essentially that, that, that they're here. That right. They are not. And that is definitely the case. Now, do you have any um, observations of what might be going on on the moon currently or on Mars, let's say? Do you think that there are bases up there? I think they found materials that substantiate that there had been some time, some type of presence of some kind of humanoid on the surface of not only the moon, but also on Mars itself. And that the physical data that they are documenting, that they are playing it off as if, oh, naturally occurring phenomena. That's oh. very hard to believe. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, they've been doing that all along. You yeah. know, so, but, okay. but that, it's unfortunate. It's unfortunate. Why do they keep everything such a secret? What do you think that's all about, Wilbur? I think that that, that information, that possibly that society would find out that extraterrestrials are real, that that information would destabilize society. And society is already <laughs> economically destabilized. So you can't necessarily say that that destabilization is due to <laughs> extraterrestrials. Right. Um, and... I guess my other question here on that note would be, are we amongst extraterrestrials here? And uh, you, you obviously believe so. Um, have you ever come across them yourself, other than some of the stuff that you've got in your footage? Have you ever come across personally? I couldn't answer, I couldn't answer that because if I did, their presence was so perfected in the sense that you couldn't tell they were aliens or not. You know, they're among us. They look like us. The only difference would be their atomic physiological structure. And obviously, by the fact that they don't come from this planet, their atomic structure would be totally different than ours, even though they look the same. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so, you, so you're saying, you know, it's a, so you've never even, you've never had an encounter with an alien being? I did as a child. Um, when when this all first happened to me in England in the early 60s, and that was a face-to-face -face encounter, and they implanted me with something, and basically this in-flight has been sending me messages to take photographs, and, and the photographs I have on my website are the direct result of the information that's sent to me by whatever is in me. And based on that physical data, you look at all of the samples that I have, and you can conclude that obviously there's something there that's directing me to these objects, and the objects appear in my samples. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, where do, where is this going for you? Where do you th what do you think the big picture is? Because you've been um, chasing crafts, uh, you know, for pretty much all your life, haven't you? Basically, because mm -hmm. they're, they're, that's where, obviously, they were outside of, of my control, especially in the things that I experienced as a child. So with, with, with all that in mind, we could only conclude that essentially that which I am getting is the direct result of extraterrestrial contact. Right. Now, you're more adjusted to that because of your encounter as a, you know, in your youth. So I would say that you're probably much more adjusted to that than somebody who's just now vibing on the possibility of ETs and crafts and so forth. Um, with that in mind, do you think that that makes you a little bit uh, more adventurous, you know? I'm, I'm used to it, but keep in mind that even 
even to this day with some of the objects and the events that I've been able to document, that at some point it hits home and I start to freak out and wonder what it is that is making these things manifest in front of my camera and camera lenses. So at some point, um, you start to, uh, it almost becomes common in a sense that it's like a regular occurrence and you don't react as a person who's never had those types of experience before and becomes a fearful event to them. To me, it's not a fearful event. I sit there and actually look at these options as they manifest. So it's not something that scares me. Right. But like you said, at the same time, you know, you really have so much proof um, that it's that it's a reality, and that's per, per, part of, you know, the little bit of a mini freak out every now and then, just going, wow, this really does exist. Where do you think, um, where do you think the hot spots are? Where, where, where have you been that you are absolutely sure, or, or are the hot spots anywhere you go? Well, I've got to tell you, um, <laughs> you know, after after that encounter in Area 51, and then the encounter I had in Sedona, which was a week later, and then the encounter I had in Shreveport, which was a week later after that, then taking all of these encounters that I had in the year 2012, and looking at the samples that I'm getting from my rooftop nicely from the for the last 90 days, you can think or conclude that whatever these anomalous objects are, which I imaged in Area 51 that are being imaged over my home, are now here, just based on that. Mm -hmm. What is this noise? That is my computer, which I just muted. And obviously people are listening to our show. That's okay. I've, we've got a few people on uh, here, and so I'm just trying to assess it out. Um, no problem. I thought it was a dog barking or something. Um, can you explain, you know, you said it earlier in uh, when you were in Sedona, this uh, this warp fell out of warp. What's warp and what is a cloaked craft? What does this mean? Well, it, it, and you have to look at the footage to understand what I'm saying here. In my footage, basically what happened was the camera was set to fire a photograph I believe at that time I set it to fire a photograph every 10 seconds. So every 10 seconds the camera was taking the picture. And in the star field, which I photographed initially, which was clear, which had absolutely nothing in it, in one of seven frames where this uh, object suddenly appears, it appears in the frame as uh, an object that was enshrouded with cloud matter. And when you think about that, when you look at aircraft, especially aircraft that are at high altitude, their contrail generally follows the aircraft. It is not covered around the aircraft. And that my sample showed whatever this object was had the contrail completely surrounding it. That's not consistent with what we would see if we saw an aircraft at high altitude that was being propelled by jet engines that generally would leave the vapor trail, which we call as a contrail. And it, to me, indicated that whatever this object was, and it suddenly appears in the frame, that it, especially based on the physical samples that I have from above my home, and it clearly shows objects come from wormholes, which suddenly appear in my frame samples as distortions. And as this distortion appears, you would see the object in the next frame that, that immediately follows this distortion. In the samples that I got in Sedona, it's exactly the same thing, and that's what I got. I got objects that appeared relatively out of nowhere, and that would appear in the image area itself. But what was interesting in the samples that I took in Sedona, I used a 20 millimeter lens, so it's a wide angle shot. So the object that I photographed in the sample was extremely large, larger than any aircraft I would imagine. That How big? Um, I, I'm going to tell you probably three times the size of three jumbo jets. It was huge. And it probably didn't make any noise. It was absolutely silent other than the dogs and coyotes barking. Mm -hmm. now, was, now, did you see this? Did you view this object or catch this object in the daylight or at night? It was, it was about 3.45 in the morning um, okay. in the desert there. And, you know, there was no light at all. And one of the things you don't want to do ever in life is go somewhere in a desert without a flashlight. But I was mm -hmm. essentially using the camera technology to guide me through the uh, area because it is essentially, um, it has sensitivity uh, up to 
didn't allow me to see into darkness. And that um, when I did that, what was even more interesting is I felt that something was watching me. And um, I was more concerned about what was going on around me than what was being imaged by the camera. And I didn't notice what was being imaged by the camera until I got back to the hotel and looked at the footage. So it was indeed a uh, close encounter that I did have there, but it was just even more bizarre in the sense that I didn't see anything, but I felt it. And it was creepy in a sense because I felt fear, and that's all I could feel, fear. And, and when I felt that, I left the desert as quickly as possible. No doubt. And you didn't really know where that was coming from, like you said, until you looked over the footage. And then what? And then what, Will? <laughs> Wilbur, when well, you looked at the footage and you see this gigantic craft. I mean, there's that reaction again. It's the same reaction I had from the footage I took from the U.S. Capitol building with the green object that parked directly above my head. What That's you crazy. Take, take the photograph. And, and at some point, you hope there's some... And thanks. And our guest today is uh, Wilbur Allen. If you want to uh, take a look at his website, it's uh, www.ufodc.com. That's UFODC is in Washington, D.C. You know, I'm on your site right now, Wilbur, and I'm looking at a really interesting photo. I've never seen anything like this. You filmed it uh, in the early a.m., it says, on March 21st of this year, which is just a few days ago. Um, I'm looking at where it appears, that I, I, I guess, that there's a sun in the sky, but it looks like there's a coil of, like, clouds. Do you know which one I'm talking about? Um, I'm going to go to the website and join you on that. Um, okay, it says, uh, 21, and it says, formation of anomalies imaged again. However, they are moving much faster. Composite image at 1 30th of a second every yeah. second at 5,000 ISO. Um, yeah. So 50, it, it's like there's like, oh, sorry, 50,000 ISO. Uh, another, yeah. That's another language for me, Wilbur. Um, this, uh, it's like a coil of around right next to the sun first of all the sun looks green and then there's this coil shooting up in the sky um like three-dimensional kind of a coil looking thing what is that it's it's um a formation of objects that um and i have to explain this to you at a 30th of a second which is motion picture sync rate that what i should have here if they were birds, with the physical structure of birds. And, and based on the exposure itself and the way the camera is focused in space, that after a certain point in focus, everything is in focus. So everything is in focus beyond a certain point. That wherever I photograph here, each frame was represented as a streak. So that essentially said to me that what these objects are doing is moving much faster than the thirties of the second shutter. Yeah, this one in this one in particular though, with the sun in the photo, and anyone that's, that's listening, that's, please go and look at this fi- picture. That's the moon, by the way. That's the moon. Oh, that's, that's the, the moon. Sun. Yes. Oh my lord. Yeah. Oh my gosh. And so, anyone that's uh, on on Wilbur's website right now, ufodc.com, it's the fourth picture down, I believe. Um, so left of the moon, right there, there are these coils, like a ladder, going from the bottom of the frame all the way to the top of the frame. And it's turning. It's turning in the frame. Is that what it's doing? It, it, it actually it turned. And, you know, one of the things that I'm going to start doing, which it's not doing, especially with this type of technology that I'm using, is one of the problems in capturing events like this is that most cameras that are high definition can only record 20 minutes best in high definition of video at any given point in time because of the memory buffer that's associated to generate high definition video. So what I do is essentially with understanding the premise that stuff happens every second, and I use another word in place of stuff, but right. stuff happens every second that in this case, indeed, based on the camera being programmed at a 30th of a second fire, a frame every second for the duration of six hours, which essentially gives me 20,000 frames. In those 20,000 frames, I'm getting anomalous objects, and that those anomalous objects would be rep- represented in one frame, and that that one frame essentially would be the point in which 
those events take place. So basically what I'm doing is you can't be at a certain place all the time when something happens. But you can have something there that takes a picture every second that will capture whatever happens in that given period of time. That is essentially, indeed, what I've been able to do in capturing UFO anomalies. Just just fantastic stuff. Um, also, I'm looking at something you shot on February 27th of this year as well. And um, it's a formation. Um, uh, you're comparing it to the 1951 UFO squadron the analysis? That's we're talking about here because that object, that formation, those streaks that I was saying something, mentioning to you, here are the six conditions in which these objects showed up the first time. And you know, it looks like it's daytime, but it is indeed nighttime, and there's two blue dots that are in there are the stars. And that what these objects did in traveling through the clouds against the wind in which the wind was blowing, it demonstrates that they were not um, anything that would be um, conventional or indigenous, like a bird or something of that nature, because as they flew into the, cou- into the clouds, they illuminated the clouds. That indicated that they had a self form of energy or something self illuminating them. So they weren't being illuminated from ground reflection. They were illuminating themselves. And the samples clearly showed light characteristics that were extraordinary, to say the least, especially under the conditions. And under those conditions, it was a windy snowstorm while these were being taken. Well, it's interesting because you, you pointed out that the two. Uh, on the uh, blue or on, on the right are the stars and then the rest of it you're right it's after, they're white they're very white and uh, there's a string of them uh, on the top and then if you look right under the string directly under it it, it looks like an it's an actual shape that's in you know it's a yeah. geometric shape that cannot possibly be birds it's a, it's a formation it's an interesting formation in the sense that it sure. seemed to have one object that led them, and it had uh, a single object that was trailing as if it was watching their back. And it was very interesting that in filming that particular event, if you go onto my website and you do see those pictures, if you click over the picture, it'll take you directly to the video footage that these pictures were taken from, and you can see the actual footage itself. And in some cases, I have to run that footage in slow motion because the events happen so fast. You will not see them. But nevertheless, even though you don't see them, that one frame clearly indicates that that event did indeed take place. So you can't dispute the fact that, you know, okay, well, we didn't see anything. Well, she just did. You weren't there when it went down, but the camera indicated that it did happen. And here's the fact. Right. Now, um, thank you for explaining that. Now, on February 2nd, you also have a very interesting one. I hope that listeners are popping into these photos because it really helps that Wilbur is here to explain this to us. Um, there's one that you've uh, got for uh, February tw- uh, 2nd. Uh, video indicates that this recurring anom- anomaly has interest in this area. It, what it is, is the photo is on the left hand side of the screen, you've got a, a bunch of dots, two lines of uh, a bunch of dots all on the left-hand side, you know, in a row, in a line. Yeah. Okay, so um, what what would that depict? Like, how how fast was the camera well, what, taking what's that? Happening, what's happening is you notice there's one dot, one line of dots that has no dots at the end of it. Yes. And the rest of the dots followed. What happened was there were two objects, and one object was in front of the other as it led it. So what we're looking at is a frame-by-frame analysis of two objects fly by. Uh-huh. And what was the thing I had to, is something similar happened to me on the 6th of 5-6-2012. Uh, I forgot what month five is. You have to bear with me. I'm, I'm <laughs> but um, in that month, I shot video. And I'm sitting in a new BMW with a friend of mine, and I'm taking pictures from the sunroof of this BMW with this video camera. And these two objects, one object leading the other, fly by. Now, when I submitted that footage to Peter Davenport, Peter Davenport tried to tell me, oh, you photographed an aircraft. Well, I had to dispute that with him because in the samples that I photographed, if you did a frame-by-frame analysis, you would see that there were clouds in the back of this anomaly or series of anomalies. And the clouds also had stars behind there. 
And then when these objects pass through the clouds and the stars, you wouldn't see anything to sort the star at all. So that would indicate that that was not a solid object, but two individual objects as they flew by. And here I'm sampling the same thing again. And I've got the same set of objects on three additional uh, references that are imaged from the same point of view above my house. And I live five blocks from the White House. So what does that also say? Right, right. No, this is really interesting. I mean, in your opinion, because you know how fast these are, you know, what do you say, every every second that is your camera is shooting a photo? Yes. So if that were the case, and you have a few of these with these parallel lines, uh, vertical parallel lines with all the dots, it, it, it... what it is is the craft is appearing. Is this correct? The crafts are appearing as little dots because that's how fast it was going. Yes. Okay. The the second question I have is if it was going that fast, which is sounds pretty phenomenal. How could Peter Davenport say that it was an aircraft? Well, if you look at the comments Peter makes on most of the reports that are on his website, you would think Peter has a direct knowledge of exactly what these people are making a report of, and it's not. It's biased information. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I have Peter's website for the fact that he has this overwhelming amount of physical data. Sure. For everything that I do, and, and here's how I do it. I use the date that I take my photographs. And I looked at the date that the reports come in on his website, and I start noticing a match to everything oh, okay. I put on his website. So, you know, it's 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 one hand washing the other, but when the other hand is trying to dispute the facts and data that it is presenting, and and, and interjecting bias associated to it, which you know, one person cannot physically tell me. Oh well, what you photographed was not a UFO, and Peter would say to me that what I photographed was not UFOs, especially the 2002 sample. But NASA JPL file says it is a UFO, so Peter's wrong. That's right. What it right. Well, you know what? Um, you know, I've known Peter for I don't know 25 plus years, and and you're right. He's he's he has a lot of information, but it's unfortunate. It's unfortunate that he would be biased with this. It's pretty obvious stuff, and so are the rest of all these frames. I mean, what you're catching is um oh my gosh, what is the focus on your camera at this point? Like I like I said, I don't speak camera language, but uh, explain to us how 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 big, for instance, um. The object would be in the cylinder photo that you took on 220, which are very similar to the other cylinders that are coming right through. I'm looking that's, at one in that's particular. That's another weird thing. How am I getting the same photograph constantly? I know. Um, I would say I would say these objects would probably be, especially with the type of lens technology that I use, and in some of the cylinders are close to the images that I have. Mm-hmm. That they would probably be the size of a public bus. Maybe bigger. Okay. Maybe maybe three buses in a row. And they're moving pretty darn fast. Very fast. It has a contrail associated to it, which indicates it has a propulsion technology. Associated. Right. The contrail, exactly. And I do see that in a few of these. You know, now, I'm glad you mentioned it because now I do notice that contrail. I might not have noticed it before, but yeah, they've got. So 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 then 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 okay. If they've got a jet propulsion, then these aren't easy. And what is it? I what, I don't know. <laughs> see, we can't, you can't, and that's where a lot of people like to put their two cents worth in there. I'm not going to be a fool and tell you what they are because I don't know what they are, but I can show you the realities of the objects. That's completely different than me trying to put conjecture associated to it. And I'm not going to tell you things I do not know, and I right. don't tell you things I don't know. I'm just right. Trying to no, no, you're making a lot of sense. You really are. You make a lot of sense. Um, I hope people are enjoying this stuff. And, of course, I just passed your red, red, big redneck vacation photo. <laughs> it's hilarious. <laughs> it is yeah. hilarious. People need to take a look at this, too. What, now, what do you guys do? Well, you're not even in this picture, but there's two guys in the picture with holding shotguns, and one of them is pointing I, I at the camera. A, I am in, in that series on television because, basically, I, I <laughs> let my video camera running while... Uh, while one of the rednecks hands me a, a loaded 357, and you know, I pop <laughs> down. After chugging down maybe eight or nine beers, 
that's not something you really want to do, but it was a controlled environment, totally. Right. I had absolutely wonderful time, and I'm going to tell you, it was publicity for my website, and you would not think that the Country Music Channel would go that far as to present that level of data, and they did, and I'm really impressed with MTV Country Music Channel doing that. Oh, that's awesome. Absolutely. That's really, really cool. Um, thank you also, Roxy, because your first interview with me um, got a lot of people's attention, and I've got to thank you for that. Oh, you're very welcome, Lover. Glad to help you. Yeah, I see that, I see that loaded here. Um, you know, you're very welcome, and any time you get some... I love I love what you said here under the um, big red neck vacation photo, um, shooting your alien friends, well, Burr. <laughs> That's how he taught me with straight up redneck, and you know what? <laughs> i got to tell you, they are in need of extraordinary people, and that title redneck may not be a true definition of them because I was impressed with not only their kindness, but they were just very decent people, and they were funny. And I had a great time, and I, I, all I can say is I love them dearly. And I'm a redneck, basically. That's very cool. That's very cool. That's fun stuff. What do you think is the most intriguing uh, on file that you have to date, the most intriguing footage that you have to date that just even blows your mind to this day? All of it. All of it does. Because yeah. I can't explain. You know, well, first, if you go to the newer stuff that I'm presenting on the top of the website, all of the new stuff is blowing me away. For the yeah. fact that I've got page after page after page. But there's got to be one, Wilbur. There's got to be one that just thing. blows your mind. That, that blows me away right there. I mean, most day after day of the same thing, that, that's heavy. But the most abstract anomaly that I photographed was with the fashion models where the object came oh, out of the right. wall and morphed and flies through frame after frame, flies through morphing, and flies out of the point of view of the camera reference. That, to me, was absolutely bizarre. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, you know, I've got, I've got another question about um, D.C., um, when you were talking about that, when you were doing that footage, you that was that caught you totally off guard, didn't it? It absolutely did. It wasn't anything that I anticipated um, experiencing, especially the 2002 event. What happened in 2001, which led up to 2002, is even more significant. I had a supervisor that worked with me in the White House, and he was covering a conference with Senator John Glenn, and during the conference with John Glenn, he claimed to have seen extraterrestrials around John Glenn and went crazy during this news conference seeing these aliens. Well, a year after he went crazy, I had the close encounter in Lower Senate Park. So it indicated to me that there was indeed an extraterrestrial presence. There is a possibility that that extraterrestrial presence infiltrated the Capitol. And that's essentially what the photographs are insinuating. But, you know, I still like to deal with people who said to me, well, what, you photographed the lens flares and blah, blah, blah. Well, those lens flares were photographed in space by Apollo 7 and Apollo 11. Right. They're not right anymore. So they shut up. So everything right. now after 10 years was an actual close encounter. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Wow. There, you know, uh, people need to hop on here because you've got some incredible footage, especially when you close in on a picture. You've got one that looks like, oh gosh, when, it, when is it? It's, it looks like it was from, well, you say that it matches the. Uh, the image above Shreveport, Louisiana on 11-1-2012 and in Japan 11-15-2012. It's a long uh, cylindrical sphere, but it's got a bunch of lights all around it. Well, those, those are stars. Those are the stars. And see, when, when they start well, what about the red and the green stuff? That's stars too? Um, that I can't answer. That no, can't no, answer. no, 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 no. I, this is, doesn't look like stars. This looks like a cylindrical object, and the, everything that well, it's it's like a line. You know exactly what I'm talking about. But then there are, if these are stars, they're all lined up on both sides of it in the same place on both sides of this object. Of oh, the that in Shreveport or in Air, I'm sorry, that happened in Sedona. I'm, I'm gonna make a guess. No, this is further down your page. This is um, I don't think this is Sedona. Um. It says, um, it's, 
Oh, I don't even know what number it is. I'm way down your page. I'm just, uh, it's, you've got well, quite well, a few well, of them. You're going to get lost. I mean, there's like, there's more archive pieces of data on my website, perhaps, than that. Oh, lost, people so. need to just come and look at this because this is just fascinating. No, I, I guarantee you these aren't stars. This is lines with the lights right on the line, on both sides of the line, green and red, it appears. But oh, then again, this that, is night. That's, so, that's Sedona. That's when the object... This is uh, Sedona? Oh, my goodness. Discharging smaller objects into the air. Oh, and, you my know, gosh. If, if you look at some of the reports, like the reports from Rendlesham, where they were talking about the object was in the sky and it was drifting objects into the air as it was there, we're looking at essentially the same events. But yeah, you are. Oh, that's really fascinating stuff. That's really fascinating stuff. So, what's on the agenda? I mean, what are you what are you doing currently? And I know that I want to try to get together with you and do an on camera interview. So, I look forward to that if we can really make that happen in the next, uh, that, I guess, week. Today, I'm going to be there on the fifth instead of the second. It's from the fifth to the tenth. Oh, you are okay. So you take okay, great. And I'll oh, be at the oh, yeah. Sedona Riyadh, which is the only hotel in Sedona, so you can't. It won't be difficult for you to find me, um, but it will be difficult if I leave the hotel and I start walking because I go in the desert and I do hikes and I like to do research. And in doing my research, the way I do things, I always encounter these events and I'm able to document it. So I'm going to show without a doubt that there is indeed a extraterrestrial base in Sedona. Well. I'm going to Right. And and I was going to say, you know, for anybody who doesn't know Sedona that's listening, you know, it is the fabled enchantment resort, right? Yes, it's a, it's a portal, so to speak. And if there is indeed a portal there in the standard technology that I'm utilizing right now, I'll be able to see the gate that opens that portal in my samples. Oh, my gosh, that'd be fabulous. Well, you know, that's that's this is... Uh, even people that I know that aren't ufologists, so to speak, or researchers, th- have gone and stayed at the enchantment, and they see stuff coming right out the side of the mountain up there. Exactly. So with, with all the samples that I have, it's clearly without a doubt because I have the ability to go transcend solid matter. And um, Oh, my gosh. You, you have to think that, okay, if they have this ability, then what would be the logical place for them to stay would be directly in front of us, but where we can't see inside a mountain, underground, underwater, that's where they are. Absolutely. I mean, it's it's like I say, that's fabled. I mean, there are some who think it's an underground military base, not necessarily an ET base. Anything that has the ability to go through solid matter cannot be humanly possible. And it is not U.S. military. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, like I say, I think that's probably disinformation to confuse people because there are many, there have been many sightings. But I don't think we have a technology that can fly between a mountain. And that's why I imaged in Area 51. I've got objects flying into mountains and then they don't fly out. But they're still (laughs) opening them. I've seen that myself. Um, I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, there's the, the yeah. I, well, I don't think we do, but you know, that's an I don't know for me. I don't know. I don't know what we have the capability of doing right now. That's the time, though. That's my purpose of going there. My initial visit there, I just got this camera. And I did do a very good job with it, but it's not the same as the camera I have now. Now that I know it, and now that I know this technology, I'm going to go in there and take video. And those, that video footage that I am going to generate in that desert is going to flow show without a doubt where these objects are emanating from. Absolutely. Absolutely. This is going to be fabulous. This is going to be so awesome. And one more question for you, Wilbur. Um, I just have to ask it for all the um, you know uh, people who are working in the land of chemtrails. Do you think that chemtrails are a part of a, a military, co- you know, to cover up uh, some of the action I, going on in the that sky? That is the case in that these chemtrails do is to choose your uh, point of view, your field of vision, and that. But what's interesting is if these objects do appear and the chemtrails do diffuse the sky, their luminosity is still going to give them away, so it really doesn't hide their presence. Right. Right, because I see you've got one uh, 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 aircraft with a contrail at night. Yeah. Um, and and was that just a typical aircraft there that you filmed? Um, you know... Or do you not know? I need to answer that, because I see, I see the nav lights, I see the red, 
I mm-hmm. see the white the red green. Red mm-hmm. light. But then if you go down, you see there's a helicopter, but look at the frame that's below the helicopter. Oh, I know. I see this right now. Oh, my God. At that point, we're going to make a calculated guess and assume that is where the object's base is, and we're going to try to find that base when we go back into the desert in the next few weeks. Oh, really? Yeah. Um, so, so you really don't know exactly where you were, but you're going to try to hunt that down. And then what about this... Um, the puncture on your finger. Now, how did how did that happen? I I, I I can't tell you because I'm I'm not really sure exactly what what transpired when I was out there. Um, all I could say is that when I went from the desert back to my hotel, that on my finger was um, this very unusual puncture wound. And I say unusual in a sense because on the surface of the finger was a small orifice where obviously something had gained entrance into the finger, but underneath the skin was an area which looked as if it had been bored out and pieces of the tissue that were in my fingers were unplugged and pulled out uh, as this thing, whatever it was, drew blood from my finger. It was very abstract. And you had mentioned to me that it took about six weeks to heal. Uh, it took an extremely long time to heal. I'd never seen anything quite like that before because, you know, what, what was the interesting thing is was the small orifice. Ex- embodied voice commanding him to pack his stuff and get out. I, I wouldn't even know what I'd do if I heard that. And at Area 51, the military is working with the assimilated alien technology and have operational craft possibly built with the assistance of ETs. Alan has surmised this, you know, uh, so we'll see. We'll we'll get it behind this. Um, recent years, you know, uh, camera sensitivity has increased tenfold, allowing some of the cloaked ships to be caught on camera, particularly in high-speed shutter images shot at one eight thousandth of a second. So I really look forward to seeing what's happening next. And without any further ado, welcome, Wilbur Allen. How are you? I am well. Thank you for having me again, Rossi. Oh, that's good. To, I'm glad that you're well. And this last trip, well, you know, you're you're record, you're doing a documentary right now, so I'm sure it's just full of a bunch of really cool stuff. Um, but this really intrigued me. Um, you know, I believe that you were in Sedona when this um, object came out of warp. I was in Sedona in the desert, and I, I really couldn't tell you where in the desert I was because what I what I had done, I think we talked about this before, but I had uh, gone uh, from my hotel location um, outside of the hotel perimeter in absolute darkness with a camera and a tripod, and I started walking, and I walked for about 45 minutes. And in the middle of the desert, um, or I could not tell you where I was because I couldn't see a thing. I started to uh, set my camera up and uh, photograph the skies. And as I started photographing the skies, all of the dogs and coyotes started howling. And when I looked at the film at that point, I noticed that there was an object that materialized out of nowhere. And it was completely enshrouded in cloud-like matter. And then every shot where this anomaly was imaged that this cloud matter was dissipating from it. And at some point in the sample, it seemed to have been discharging smaller anomalies into the air as it, it came to a uh, stop. It stopped in the sky. It was absolutely abstract. Oh, my goodness. And, and what were these you, you, things it was dropping out? Was it other craft? I'm, I'm going to make, it, make uh, a wild call and say, yes, it was other craft, because based on the samples, there were anomalies that would appear on this cylindrical-like anomaly that was photographed, and that in each shot afterwards, that these white anomalies that appeared on the cylindrical sur- on the sur- cylinder were um, discharged into the air. And you could see these objects streaming off of them, off of the object that uh, slowed down and stopped. So based on that footage we got in the desert.
Revolution Radio proudly presents live from Phoenix, Arizona, the Truth Deny Talk Radio with host Roxy Lopez. Join us here for topics you won't hear about on mainstream news, such as chemtrails, GMOs, nutrition, and conspiracy facts regarding your personal sovereignty. Humanity is 7 billion strong. We are the majority. And now, live from the Valley of the Sun, your host, Roxy Lopez. And a good evening to everybody, and thanks for joining us tonight. Hello, chat room. I see all of you. you got any questions for either one of our guests tonight, go ahead and post them. Our producer will get them to me. And then, of course, everyone that's on the event pages, man, you guys are just pouring in there. Um, really appreciate the listenership. You are just uh you're wonderful. You're absolutely wonderful. Um, we will be answering questions that you have listed also in the on the event page, and so uh, we'll try to get to everything. Hey, you know, I don't know uh, we've, we've, we're, what's going on. I don't know what you're hearing on your end, everybody out there, but it, it's all good. I believe that we just had a probably a commercial free, almost a, an entire commercial free um, uh, hour with James Gilliland, and of course, I'm excited to. Uh, uh, bring our next guest on. Um, he has also been to the show uh, before, and it's just fabulous. Um, his name is uh, Wilbur Allen, and uh, Wilbur is a former uh, White House Air Force One engineer for ABC News. Wilbur Allen has been a contactee since childhood uh, when he was implanted, and since then he has forensically documented sightings and anomalies. He discussed his recent trips to investigate Area 51 and Sedona, his tele. Uh, telepathic encounters with UFOs and analysis of various sightings. And in the Sedona desert, while documenting the sky late at night, he said he saw an object come out of a warp and the dogs and coyotes immediately started to howl. Uh, then something drew blood from his finger, he says, and um, left a very unusual puncture wound. And when Will told me about that, I, I thought, oh, my goodness. But, um, you know, in video footage uh, he shot in Rachel, Nevada, he made a, the statement, show it to me. And in 15 seconds later, an aerial object appeared, which he believes demonstrates telepathy between humans and ETs. Additionally, while shooting at the perimeter of Area 51, he heard a disc 